All right, well, hello everyone, and welcome back. In this video, we are going to finish up our discussion of 1D and multidimensional arrays. And in particular, we're going to talk about some important applications of arrays. We'll talk about how arrays can be used for image manipulation, for calculations, such as Gaussian elimination, and also about how arrays can be used to build other types, such as strings, vectors, and other kinds of data structures. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so goals for today's video. First, we will briefly review multidimensional arrays and some of the sorting topics covered in our previous video. So if you haven't already done so, or if you would like further review on arrays, please check out our previous two videos covering single and multidimensional arrays. Once we've finished our review, we will start talking about applications. First, we will learn how arrays can be used to manipulate image files specifically PPM image files. We will also show an example of how arrays can be used to do different kinds of calculations. And in particular, we will look at how arrays can be used in Gaussian elimination to solve systems of equations. And finally, we will briefly introduce strings and vectors. These are two very important tools that programmers use, and they are built using arrays. So please note that these are kind of more advanced topics. I'm not going to ask you about vectors and strings for these slides. So the specific slides in point three here will not be covered on an exam in this class, but I think it's worth introducing these topics because if you take any more advanced programming courses, it's very good that you know how strings and vectors work. You may find that if you start programming in more complex programs or even in a career path, you might find yourself using vectors a lot, and even more often than regular old arrays. So I'll just note here that vectors and the extra string topics will not be covered on exams in this course. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Let's first start with a review question. Suppose I have this array shown here. This is just a 2D array. Let's assume the rows are the first element in my array numbering. And let's assume these are my columns. Question's asking, which item corresponds to exams to one? Take a moment and see if you remember. The important thing for this question is to remember that array numbering starts at zero. So this will be row zero, column zero. Then we have row one, column zero. And in our third row, we actually have row two, column zero. So row two, column one will actually contain the number 85. So make sure you remember when working with multidimensional arrays that numbering starts at zero. And for the purpose of our course, we assume that the first item listed corresponds to our rows, and then the second item in square brackets gives us our number of columns when working with multidimensional arrays. 
let's do a little bit more review from our past video. First, why do we bother learning about multidimensional arrays? You'll remember that multidimensional arrays are extremely common and extremely important in programming. A good example of this is a table in a spreadsheet. Or you may even visualize arrays as one of those shelves that contains multiple rows and columns. So in this example, you can see if I declare this 2D array named exams with rows, rows, and columns, columns, I'm going to end up with declaring a set of int type variables. And essentially, I'm allocating memory for 20 int variables within a grid of memory. And I can access each of those int values individually by simply referring to the item in square braces. In our last video, we also reviewed how to manipulate and initialize 2D arrays. And you'll remember from our array sandbox that usually the best way to initialize 2D arrays and the way that I expect you to do it in this course is to use nested for loops. And so we basically iterate for each column in each row, we go through and we update the values. So make sure you get comfortable using nested for loops to manipulate arrays and to change the values, do any kind of math in those arrays. It's an extremely important skill, and I guarantee you there's going to be questions asking about it on the next exam in this class. It's also possible to initialize 2D arrays using this braces notation. This is less common, and typically it's only used if you have a very small amount of data to put in your array. For this course, I expect you to use for loops to initialize your arrays. So please be careful to pay attention to assignment instructions. I will often specifically say that you must use for loops and that I will not accept the curly braces notation. All right, so let's briefly review just a couple more points. In our last video, we learned how to use multidimensional arrays in functions. And you'll remember that the rules for working with multidimensional arrays are quite similar to working with single dimensional arrays and functions. So key things to remember here are that you want to use only the array's name when you are calling a function that takes an array as an argument. But in the declaration and definition, you do need to include those square braces next to the array's name. And notice that if you are declaring and defining a function that takes a multidimensional array, we can actually choose to either include or not include this first dimension. But we have to give the size of all the other dimensions of the arrays. And so you always want to make sure that you have a way of telling C++ and, and your compiler how big your array is. So notice here, we actually have an extra an extra argument in our function that will specify how big that first dimension is. Another way to specify the size of an array for functions is to use a global constant. And if that constant is available globally, then all the functions can access it and know how big your array will be. 
So please be sure to follow these rules when working with multidimensional arrays and functions. And if you'd like further review, I highly recommend checking out our previous video on multidimensional arrays. Finally, in our previous video, we also introduced sorting algorithms. And sorting algorithms are very important for organizing and searching large sets of data. We introduced a total of three algorithms that you should know for this course. The first one is selection sort. In selection sort, we find the minimum value in our array and we swap that minimum value with the item in the very first position. Then we search the remaining portion of the array for the next minimum, and then we place the next minimum in the second position. And we keep repeating this process until the entire array is sorted. The next algorithm you should know is bubble sort. Remember that bubble sort works by comparing adjacent values two at a time. And as we read pairs of values, we swap the values as needed so that the smaller value is listed first. And we keep repeating until the entire array is sorted. Finally, the last algorithm you should know about for this course is insertion sort. Insertion sort works very similarly to the way many people sort a hand of playing cards. What you do is you read each value in your array, starting with index zero and continuing until all the items have been read. And each time you read a new value, you check that value and then insert the item at the correct position in the sorted part of the array. And we keep repeating until the entire array has been sorted. So please make sure that you understand the procedure for how all three of these algorithms work. There may be a question or two on our next quiz or exam asking you to correctly recognize which algorithm may be used when sorting a certain set of data. If you'd like further review, please do check out our previous video and the section on sorting algorithms. Before we move on, let's go ahead and do a very quick practice on sorting. On this slide, we have three mystery sorts. And so these mystery sorts show a set of data as it is being processed by an unknown sorting algorithm. So essentially the array on the left is our initial array that is unsorted. And then we can see each pass of the sorting algorithm is another image of the array, and then finally the rightmost array is the sorted end result. All right, so take a moment and look closely at these mystery sorts. See if you can correctly identify which sorting algorithm was used to sort each of these sets of data. The algorithm must be either bubble sort, selection sort, or insertion sort. Pause the video if you'd like, and then we'll explain. All right, first, let's start with mystery sort number one. The first thing to do here is to look at what is happening in this sorting algorithm. What you can see is happening here is that initially we have our data as shown and then look what happens. The value number five gets moved to the first slot 
value number 1 is getting moved in front of the 5, then value number 0 is being moved to the very front, and then finally value number 9 is kept in its current position. Then we see value number 10 is also put in its correct position, and value number 3 is inserted in the, in the middle. Finally, value number 4 is inserted between the 3 and the 5. Can you tell what sorting algorithm is being used here? Notice how we are reading through the set of data, looking at the next value in the array, and then inserting it in the correct position. Mystery sort number one is an example of an array being sorted using insertion sort. Let's now consider mystery sort number two. Notice what happens in the first few cycles of mystery sort number two. In the beginning, our minimum item is found and placed in the first position. Then our next minimum item is found and placed in the second position. Then our third minimum is found and placed in the third position. This is a good example of selection sort. In selection sort, we identify the minimum place it in the first position, and keep repeating with the next minimum until the entire array has been sorted. Finally, by process of elimination, we can conclude that mystery sort number three must be using bubble sort. And one way you can tell this immediately is you can recognize that the heaviest items are sinking to the bottom of the array. So basically here, our largest values are seen to sink to the bottom, and the smaller values bubble up to the top. And that sinking happens because we are comparing pairs of values two at a time, and putting the larger value in the, in the farther higher index position. That allows the larger values to sink to the bottom of our array. So please make sure you are comfortable understanding how these three algorithms work. It's a very good skill to know, and there may be some questions about this in our next quiz or exam. Now that we've finished our review, let's continue with the discussion of applications of arrays. Let's begin first with how arrays can be used to manipulate images. So the first important application of arrays that we'll cover here is image manipulation. You may have heard of image manipulation before. If you've done any work with displays or LEDs, you will see that there are many different ways that you can store data for an image. So for example, if I have an image which is just four pixels, One way that we could store data for an image is by using arrays. And one way that image data is stored is by encoding each pixel in the display with a value 
RGB, where basically R is the red level, G is the green level, and B is the blue level. Often these levels range from 0 to 255, where 0 is basically none, and 255 is the maximum. So you could imagine how if you're trying to store an image and it has a lot of pixels and, and a lot of locations, it could be very convenient to store all the pixels for an image in a grid or array-like structure. So one approach that we'll look at is to use a 3D array to store data for an image. And essentially in a three-dimensional array, what we are doing is we make an array that has some number of rows, some number of columns, and a third dimension, which in this case would be an R, G, or B value. And so at each row and column, we can store an R value, G value, and B value corresponding to the color of an image's pixel. So this is one way that we can use arrays and C++ to help us actually encode data in images. So let's take a look at some code that is similar to one of our assignments. And we'll see in this example that we can use arrays and functions to help us actually manipulate data and produce PPM image files. Let's go ahead and first take a look at the demo and the code in action, and then we'll explain what a PPM image is and how all this code works. So first, we'll take a look at the sample code, and we'll see that we have some 3D arrays that we're using, and you'll see that I've declared an array that has three dimensions. We have we have rows, columns, and a third dimension, RGB. So we'll use this array, a 3D array, to store an R, G, and B pixel at each row and column to represent an image. Let's go ahead and open CLion and take a closer look at this code. All right, so let's go ahead and take a quick look at this sample code for painting by 3D Array. You can see we've used some global constants here to specify the number of rows and columns in, in our image. So right now we just have two rows, two columns. And my third dimension I have named RGB. RGB is basically the space where we would put either a red, green, or blue pixel for our image. And, and so basically the RGB value tells us how red, how green, and how blue our pixel needs to be in order to produce the correct color. 
I've also written some functions for this Paint by 3D Array program. You can see that each function takes a 3D array as an argument. And then, depending on the function, we do different tasks. For example, in this first function, pixel by pixel, we prompt the user to fill in values for each element in the array from my argument. So this allows me to go through an array one pixel at a time and specify how red, how green, and how blue each pixel will be. And once I have specified, then the data is saved inside that 3D array. My next function is called write image to file. And this function is actually already written. And what it will do is it will take the array that I want to output and it will output all the rows, columns, and pixels into a data file. And it will properly format this data file so that it can be opened and viewed as a PPM image. We'll talk more about PPM images in just a moment, but basically this is an image format that our computers can look at and read and process so that we can view our images. And finally, one last function that I have written is this function called paint red image. And Notice what this function does, is it will set each pixel to contain the RGB value 255, 0, 0. Basically, we are setting red to the maximum and green and blue to the minimum. And this will make a pure red image and update all the values in my array of interest to contain red pixels. In one of our assignments, you might see that your task is to actually add more functions to this program in order to create different kinds of images. Now that we've described the functions, let's just take a look at what this program does. I have a menu here, so you can see what this program is doing is it's using a while loop to keep running as long as we have not chosen to quit. And what you'll do here is you can, this menu runs and works just fine, so you can choose what option you want to do. Do you want to paint an image pixel by pixel? Do you want to make a red image? Do you want to make some other images? Or do you want to exit? Notice there's also a choice to output your image to the file of your choice. And you can see what happens here. We take in the menu choice from the user, and we use a switch statement to call a certain function depending on what option is chosen. For example, if I want to paint my image one pixel at a time, I will have chosen choice one from my menu, and notice I call the pixel by pixel function in order to actually ask the user for each pixel one at a time. Similarly, if I choose option two, that means I wanted to paint a red image, so the program will call the paint red image function. And then you'll see for an assignment, you might need to add code for some of these other functions. Finally, for our function that saves our array to a file name, you'll see that if I choose option six, it will call write image to file. And notice we will use the output file name provided by the user when we write our image to the file. And you can see, finally, examples 
of each of these functions being written and defined. So for pixel by pixel, since I have a 3D array, I use three nested for loops. And I go through and I ask the user to give me RGB values for each pixel at each location in my array. And then based on these user specified pixels, I update the appropriate element inside my array. And then finally, once that has finished, the data is updated and I go back to main. Similarly, to paint the red image, notice what we do is we have nested for loops, but we set the for loops such that each row and column of my three-dimensional array is assigned the pixel 25500 in order to create a red image. Finally, last function, you can see for the writing the image to the data file, we create an output file stream object, and then we output some header information to the data file. And then we use a loop to output all the data in our array into that data file. And once we have finished outputting our data file, then we send a message to our user and close. And you will see that this function actually allows us to produce working image files that can be opened and viewed as PPM images. Let's go ahead and try running this program so you can see the types of things it can do. So here we have run our program. We are told, welcome to Paint by 3D Array. What would you like to do? Let's first paint our image pixel by pixel. So here, I'm being prompted to enter the RGB values for the pixel at row zero and column zero. Just for fun, let's make this pixel all black. If I have RGB zero, 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 that will make my pixel completely black because there is no color for any of the R, G, or B. Next, for the second pixel, let's try the opposite and we will make the pixel completely white. To do that, I set all the R, G, and B values to 255. Now I'm being asked for the pixel at row one in column zero. Maybe I want that to be a red pixel. So I'll set it to 255 for red and zero for the other values. Finally, suppose I wanted to get a little creative. Suppose I wanted a purple pixel where I wanted both red and blue mixed together. I could set red to 255 or maybe something in between. How about 150? Maybe I have no green and 150 blue. This pixel, we expect, will be red and blue mixed together, so we should get a purple pixel. Now I have fully specified my pixel values. So now I need to output that image to the file of my choice. I'm going to choose option 6. Now I need to enter the file name where I want to write my image. I'm going to call the file name black, white, red, purple .ppm because I know that that image should contain a black, white, red, and purple pixel. And you'll see my painting has been written to that file. Let's go ahead and exit the program and see if we were able to correctly produce that image. So I'll push option seven and leave the program. 
So notice if I look in my project directory, I have a new data file here called blackwhiteredpurple.ppm. CLion doesn't want to open this because it doesn't recognize the PPM format. But I can instead choose to open this file using Notepad or with an image viewing program. I'm going to right click on this file and I'm going to choose Open in Explorer. If I open the file in Explorer, you see what I get. I'm able to get a total of four pixels in this file. I see I have a header with P322255, and then I have four sets of three RGB values. These values correspond to the pixels of my image. So what if I want to actually view this PPM data file as an image? If you use a Mac computer, you should be able to open this PPM image directly, and a Mac will immediately be able to read the PPM image as an image. If you instead use a PC or Linux machine, you'll need to instead download a different image viewing program, such as Irfan View or Adobe or one of the other programs like GIMP, and that will allow you to view the PPM image. For example, if I open this PPM image, black, white, red, purple, in Irfan View, initially I don't see anything. But if I zoom in on my image and I say fit image to window, so you'll notice here that when I first view my black, white, red, purple image, and I zoom in on it, the edges may appear blurred. In Irfan View, I need to go to View, Display Options, and uncheck Use Resample for Better Fitting. If I do this, you can see that I have indeed successfully encoded a black pixel, a white pixel, a red pixel, and a purple pixel. So, as you can see, being able to very neatly and efficiently process data in arrays, we can very quickly and easily manipulate images. So this is a really powerful application of arrays to help us store and organize and process these larger sets of data. So I highly encourage you to play around with this sample code some more and use the sample programs in this Paint by 3D Array demo to help you learn and get comfortable with making different kinds of images and processing 3D arrays. So now that we've completed our demo, let's explain briefly a little bit more about how these PPM images work. In our demo, you saw that we were able to output data for an image as a PPM file. So PPM stands for Portable Pix Map. And this is a format specification which allows each pixel of our image to be encoded by an R, G, and B integer value. As we mentioned, if you have a PC, you would need to install a image viewing program like GIMP or Irfan View. And if you use a Mac, you can actually directly open PPM files. So what does a PPM file contain? In our demo, you saw that the PPM file actually contains two parts. We have some header values that give us information about our picture. And then we have the actual body of the PPM file. And that encodes the information about each pixel in our image. So 
let's briefly introduce each part of the header and the file body. In the PPM files header, you can see that we have four values there. The very first item, that P3, that's what's called the magic number. And the PPM file specification requires that, P that the magic number be either P1, P2, or P3. P3 means we have three, pic three numbers per pixel and that the image will be a color image. P2, we have two numbers per pixel, we get a grayscale image. And finally, P1, we have a black and white image, and there is just one number per pixel. So for example, as we saw, we are working with color images here. So the P3 tells the computer that the file is a picture where each pixel will have three values. And of course, for a color image, the three values are red, green, and blue levels. As we mentioned, P2 tells the computer that we have a grayscale image, and P1 is black and white. The next items in the PPM image header are on the second row, and we see here we have two fours. This tells us the width and the height of our image. Then the third field, this 255, that specifies the maximum value, basically the maximum amount per pixel. Here the 255 tells us that the maximum red, green, and blue level is 255. So each RGB value is 0 through 255. Lastly, in the body of the PPM file, we provide the values for each pixel in our image. And in our example here, we see that we have four rows of data because our image is four pixels high. So each set of three numbers corresponds to an individual pixel. And here we have a total of 12 values per row because each group of three values corresponds to one pixel. Here's another example of how we can encode colors using pixel values. So in this example, we have a PPM image file, and we see that this top right pixel has a value of 155, 0, 155. So we get a purple color. We get a mix of red and blue. Then if we look at the top left pixel, notice the top left pixel is 0, 0, 0, or all black. Finally, the bottom left pixel, we see the bottom left is completely white because all of the pixels are maximum. And then notice the second pixel on our first row is mostly but not completely red. So we can use arrays and PPM files to directly encode and manipulate images using C++. This is a really interesting and important application where you can use C++ to help you process and modify images. And in many real-world applications, you, know, you can think of self-driving cars, image processing software, Anytime you need to 
quickly and rapidly analyze images, being able to do manipulations like this is really important. One other thing to note about the image files and the PPM images is that in our example, we have the file nicely formatted. But it's also possible to have all the data in a single line separated by spaces. So for the purpose of our class and our assignments, I do not require that you generate nicely formatted PPM files, but having the nice formatting is helpful if you are trying to understand how the data is being stored in that data file. All right, so this concludes our first example on how arrays can be used to store and modify image data. Please consider playing around more with that Paint by 3D Array example if you'd like additional practice. Let's now move on to our next application of arrays. Another very important application of arrays is in linear algebra type applications. If you've taken any other courses on linear algebra, MATLAB, or computer programming, you might remember that computers really like to solve math problems when data is stored in matrix form. And it turns out that a matrix of numbers is very easy to convert into an array in C++. One area where we can use matrices to solve problems is Gaussian elimination. You may have learned about Gaussian elimination in calculus or pre-calculus class. And this is a technique that allows us to solve systems of equations by writing that system of equations in an array or matrix form. Let's briefly refresh everyone's memory with an example. Suppose we wanted to solve this system of equations. Theoretically, we could do it by hand, but it would be kind of a pain. So instead, let's review Gaussian elimination. In Gaussian elimination, what you do is you first convert your system of equations into a matrix. You then transform your matrix into a special form. Using this special row echelon form, you can more easily find the solution of that system of equations. Let's take a look at a quick example. Suppose we had this matrix and this system of equations we wanted to solve. We take this original set of three equations and look what we do. We take all the x values, all the y values, and all the z values, and basically we put the x coefficients, the y coefficients, and our z coefficients, and finally the stuff we equal. We put all the numbers from our equations into a matrix. And this is the matrix that we use for Gaussian elimination. So we have now converted that system of equations into an initial matrix. And the next thing we do is we convert our matrix into a special form called row echelon form. And essentially what we're trying to do is set up the matrix so that we have this kind of diagonal line of ones and then zeros on the bottom and other values on the top. In order to produce this result, we add or subtract each row from each other in order to get 
a 0 in the desired location and a 1 in the desired location. Here's an example of what this process can look like. To convert this matrix into our proper row echelon form, you see that we can add the first equation to the second one, and that will get rid of the undesired negative 1 and 3 and give us a 0 and a 1. Then to get rid of the 2 in our third row, we add negative 2 times the first equation. And then to get a 0 where that negative 1 is, we add the second row to the third row. So it takes a little bit of manipulation, but we can successfully convert our matrix into that desired form. And if we do that, we end up with our matrix in the correct form. The last step of Gaussian elimination is to use what's called back substitution to find the solution. We take our matrix and we rewrite it as an equation again. But this time, notice what happens. Because we have a bunch of zeros in our equation, we can now extract the following relations. We can determine that 2z equals 4, so z must be 2. Then we can take z, substitute it into the next equation, and find that y is negative 1 then substitute our z and y into the first equation and determine our x value. So as can be seen, this Gaussian elimination can be a really powerful technique for solving systems of equations. And it's particularly useful if you have many equations. You know, maybe not just three, but 10 or 20, if you need to solve many equations at once, this can be a really powerful technique. But of course, it's a pain to do Gaussian elimination by hand, and it can get ugly pretty fast. So C++ can really help speed up Gaussian elimination. And by using what we know about loops, functions, and arrays, we can actually make programs that do Gaussian elimination for us. Here's an example algorithm of how we could complete Gaussian elimination in C++. First, we need to declare some type of data type to hold our data. So it could be a 2D array. More advanced students might also choose to use a vector. We'll talk about those a little later. Then you need to fill in the values in order to produce that input matrix. Once you've made the input matrix, you can use the Gaussian elimination algorithm provided on the next slide to process your matrix. Your goal is to return the matrix in row echelon form. And finally, you can use a second back calculation step to determine the solution for each unknown in that matrix. So it turns out the Gaussian elimination algorithm is pretty common and it's well published. So you can easily find this algorithm if you look in books and on Google. And what this code does is this code will convert an input matrix into that row echelon form. And once you have that form, then you can back calculate to solve your system of equations. And if you look at these nested for loops, you can see that this algorithm basically follows the same process we did manually. Let's take a closer look. You can see what's happening here is we're looking at each element in our row echelon form, particularly the ones that we want 
to focus on. And we have one line here that figures out what line we need to multiply by. And then this second for loop will subtract the values in order to produce the row echelon form. And so it uses this additional k variable to step through each column and perform subtraction within a given row. So by writing a well-designed nested for loop, we can actually have C++ perform Gaussian elimination for us. So if we were to go ahead and code up this Gaussian elimination solution, you can look at this example here where we have some functions that perform each step. And you can see if we run our Gaussian elimination program, we can produce the desired solution for our equations. So here's a closer look at what's happening when we run that Gaussian elimination program. When we run our Gaussian elimination algorithm, you can see what the program is doing. The loop will go through and figure out how to convert each row and column to the desired row echelon form. So here we convert our negative one to a zero. Then next, we subtract two times row zero to get rid of that two. And finally, we subtract one times row one to get rid of the negative one. Then finally, we need to use some back calculation code in order to take our Gaussian elimination row echelon form and extract out the solutions for our equations. So what our back calculation loop will do is it starts with the bottom, the bottom most row of our Gaussian elimination, and it will substitute the values into the next row until we get all the way back to the top. Here's a closer look at how that back calculation works. So what you can actually do is you can use another for loop to plug the known solution into the next row. And we can see in this output, if we follow along our for loop, we can look at each row and determine the solution for each value. So we'll go ahead and revisit more of these applications and more of the details about pointers and things like that in future videos. For now, the key takeaway that you should really remember is that C++ and what we know about arrays and functions can be used for many important applications like manipulating images and also performing math calculations. So finally, before we end for today, I would like to share two extra applications. So note that these additional slides are not going to be covered. These additional slides are not covered on exams. But the topics are very helpful, especially if you take more advanced programming classes. So let's just spend a few minutes briefly introducing two additional applications of arrays, which are strings and vectors. Strings and vectors are two very important programming tools that are built using arrays. So if you take a closer look at chapters seven and eight and 10 of starting out with C++, you can see a lot more details about strings and vectors. We're just going to briefly introduce some of these ideas in this video. 
first, let's introduce briefly where strings come from. Remember that C++ inherited some things from the C programming language. And one of the things that we inherited is what's called the C string. The C string allows us to represent whole words as arrays of characters. And a C string ends with a slash zero as the last character. We don't use C strings very often in this class, but there's just a few things that you should know about them. The first thing you should know about the C string is that the C string is inherited from the C programming language. So basically before C++ happened, C strings were the only type of string we could work with. Next, C strings allow us to represent words as arrays of characters. And the last character in our C string will be this slash zero. The slash zero has a special name. It's called the null character. And it's used to mark the end of an array because it's distinct and different from real characters. For example, if I wanted to encode the word hello in a C string, I would actually have an array with six variables. I'd have five characters for hello and a sixth character for that null. So it would literally be H-E-L-L-O and our null character. So here's another very quick example of a C string. You see that you actually declare the C string as an array of characters. And notice here, if I can actually use the code short string equals hi mom, and notice it would actually produce the below result. So here the declaration only made space for nine characters, and so you have to remember to keep room for the null character when you are declaring these arrays. For the purposes of this class, this is everything you need to know about C strings. They're really not that common and not used that often because we have better options. Let's now briefly introduce the standard string class. And these are actually the strings that we've been using in this course. And these are the ones that you'll use most often. So the strings that we have been using up to this point in the course are actually a class. And we'll talk more about classes in the coming weeks. But what you'll want to know here is that the string class improves upon C strings by adding some advantages and additional features. Remember, in order to actually use the C++ string class and all these features, we have to include string and using namespace standard with the lowercase u. So the key takeaway here is that you should know that C strings exist, but in our class, we focus most on the C++ string class, since this is the much more convenient and efficient way of handling text and text-based data. We mentioned that C strings are basically arrays of characters. But the C++ string class has many additional features that help make those strings easier to modify. For example, in the string class, we can use the assignment operator to assign value. We don't have to use nested for loops. Also, the plus sign can actually concatenate strings so you can see in this example, we can concatenate multiple strings together and produce longer strings. 
there's also no danger of strings being too small. We automatically allocate more space if our string gets longer. Notice how I did not need to specify the size of string S3. I just gave it a bunch of data and string S3 was able to hold everything I needed. Also, any text in quotes is automatically saved as string type or cast as string type. So already, instead of having to use for loops and element by element arrays, we see that the string class offers a lot of nice improvements. You may remember from our earlier videos that gitline is a really nice tool, and gitline is also a function associated with our string class. You'll remember gitline will allow us to take an input stream object and take data from that object and store it in the name of a string. So for example here, if you enter a line of text, I like C++ strings better, then notice git line C in my line would capture that entire sentence or the entire line of text into the my line string. Here's another version of gitline. By default, we stop reading text at the new line marker, but we can also change to do gitline with another character as well. For example, if I want to read until I see a question mark, notice that gitline with the extra question mark will allow us to capture all the data until the question mark is seen. I don't expect you to remember this level of detail for our course, but it's good to know that these capabilities exist in case you need them in future programs. Here's another really interesting thing that strings can do. So if I were to open up the string class and look inside, I would see that the string class still uses arrays. And so if I want to access individual characters in a string object, I can actually use square brackets, just like in arrays. For example, if I had an array named last name, or a string named last name, I can put element i and I can access the ith character. Be careful because once again, since this is array syntax, we are not checking whether that value is in range of the array. So you wanna be careful that you put a valid index there. Here's an example of this. So if I take a string named last name and I actually initialize that string last name to hold stuff, for example, here I, tell the program that my last name is Hopper from Grace Hopper. Notice what happens here. I can actually output each character one by one. And so the string name with the element in square brackets will actually allow me to access single characters inside that string. So a couple other useful features in strings. Sometimes you encounter situations where you need to convert integers or doubles into strings, or maybe you need to convert doubles or integers back to strings. And so you can do that using these functions here. Remember, they all require the string header because you're converting a string to that other type of data. And you can also use, of course, double equal 
and greater than less than to compare string objects. So once again, I don't expect you to memorize all these functions for this course, but it's really helpful to know that these tools exist in case you need them in future programs. And you can definitely see how useful it is to know about arrays because arrays are used as building blocks for other tools like strings. Lastly, let's briefly introduce vectors. We're not going to spend a lot of time on vectors in this class, and vectors will not be covered on any exam in this course. However, if you become a more advanced programmer, you'll find that more advanced programmers often prefer to program with vectors instead of arrays. So here, we will just briefly introduce what vectors are, And once again, while we won't cover them on exams in this class, you might find them helpful if you need to use arrays or array-like array -like functions and applications in other courses. Remember that arrays were really kind of used because we want to be able to organize data. But arrays are kind of a pain. We always have to worry about the size of our array we have to worry about staying within the correct index of our array. And whenever we want to manipulate an array, we have to use loops and all that extra code. It turns out that vectors are often considered a better tool. And if you end up writing a lot of programs in the real world, you might find yourself using vectors more often than arrays. Vectors behave very similar to arrays, except they have some unique properties. First, they automatically grow as your data set grows. So you don't have to declare a size initially. Vectors also know exactly how many elements they have. You can ask your vector how big it is. This is different than an array, which only stores the memory address of the zeroth element. You can also use the equal sign to set one vector equal to another. And vectors have features to help avoid out of range errors. So key takeaway to remember if you take more advanced programming courses is that vectors are generally considered better than arrays. And if you do lots of advanced programs, you may often consider using a vector instead of an array. And so let's take a closer look at what vectors are and briefly introduce their capabilities. First, vectors are actually a class. And so vectors, when you declare them and use them, you're actually creating objects built from the vector class. We'll revisit this a little bit later when we cover classes, but for now, the thing to remember is that you actually need to include this vector header in order to access the features for the vector class. You also need to include using namespace standard in order to access vector functions. You can take a look in chapter seven of our Gaddis book for some more information about vectors. Basically, they are a special data type that is defined in the standard template library of C++. For that reason, you might also hear them being referred to as STL vectors. So vectors are very similar to arrays in that they have a base type. So if we declare an int type vector, that vector can only hold int type data. So once you have assigned a base type, vectors can only hold data of that type. 
However, you can declare vectors of any kind of data, including doubles, strings, and even other user-defined objects. There's no need to determine the size of your vector when you declare and define it, because it will automatically grow if it needs more space. And you can use square brackets to access individual elements. Here's how you would declare a vector. All you need to do is take the word vector and then put the data type that you want inside. And then finally, you give your vector a name. For example, here we'll declare a vector of int type named scores. And you can see there's also some other nice things you can do if you wanted to declare 30 elements and initialize all of them to zero. Or you can even initialize, declare an initialized vector to hold the same thing as a different vector. So there's lots of really nice features that you can learn about. Another really nice feature of vectors is that they are, they are indexed, so you can access vector elements using indexing. So if you want to read or change the value of an item in your vector, for example, here if I had a vector of ints named v, I could access element i of my vector v and assign it the value 42. However, those braces cannot be used to initialize a vector element. The square brackets can only be used to change a vector element. To initialize, we need to use a function called pushback. So here are some ways that we can initialize. So one is you can use that curly brace notation. But more commonly, we initialize our vector using the pushback function. So we say our vector's name. Then we use the dot operator, and then we say push back. And then we have the value to insert. For example, if I had my vector int named numbers, which contained 10, 20, 30, and 40, if I say numbers dot push back 100, that would add 100 to the end of my vector at the next available position. In order to remove items from a vector, you can use pop back to remove the last item. To remove all the contents, you can use the clear function. And you can even use a function like empty, for example, in a loop, in order to determine whether your vector is now empty. You can also use the size function to determine how many elements are inside a given vector. And so, for example, this is really nice if you're using a for loop. Let's briefly show a couple quick examples of vectors being used in C++. So here's one example creating a one-dimensional vector of integers. Notice we have our include vector header, and we have declared an int type 
vector named v. And what we can do is notice we ask our user to give us a list of numbers. And what we do is we can go through and we can use the push back function to add the next number given to the vector v. And then finally, notice that we can also use v.size to return the size of the vector, and that will allow us to actually see how big our vector is and create for loops using the vector. Notice that this size function, it actually returns a special int called an unsigned int, but it otherwise behaves just like a normal C++ for loop and normal C++ int. Let's briefly demonstrate this vector program in CLion. All right, so here we are in CLion, and you can see that we have our vector example ready to go. And so if we go ahead and run this, let's try running it, but we place a breakpoint inside our while loop just so we can keep track of what's happening. So you can see we are first asked to enter a list of positive numbers. I'll just put some random numbers here. 1, 2, 3, 60, 100. And I'll put a negative number at the end. And you can see what this program is doing. First, we have that CN statement, and we are taking the integer 1, the first item we entered, as our next value. We can see that when we say v.pushback next, that number 1 has been added to element 0 of my vector v. If I step over again, we can see we're outputting to the screen. One has been added. Our vector size is now one item. And now our next is still greater than zero because we have our next value we entered was two. So we can go ahead and continue running our while loop. So we see we run our push back function again. And if I step over, you see that element one of our vector now contains the item two. And so we can repeat. And you see that the push back function will go through and keep adding. So now three, the third item that we listed, has been added to our vector. And finally, 60 is our fourth value. And finally, 100 is our last value. Once we read that negative 1, then our loop will end. Since next is negative 1, this is going to cause my while loop to stop. And now we can see that we have exited our loop. And now we are going to go through and output each element of our vector v to the screen. And we see if we do that, we see that we have successfully entered 1, 2, 3, 60, 100 into our one dimensional vector. So vectors are a very nice tool. Again, they're a more advanced tool that we won't use in this course. But I highly encourage you, especially if you're interested in programming and taking more advanced courses, I'd highly recommend that you consider playing around with vectors and learning how to use them. Because they're a really great tool. And many programmers find that they're a better tool than arrays for most applications. So it's also possible to create two-dimensional vectors and multi-dimensional vectors. 
similar to how we would make multidimensional arrays. In the second sample program, I show how you can create a two-dimensional vector. And to do that, you actually have to create a vector of vectors. So you can see that the 2D vector is actually a vector made out of a one-dimensional vector. And then in order to actually initialize one row of our 2D vector, we have to initialize 1D rows and stack them together to produce the 2D vector. So essentially what we do is we create an individual row and then we use push back to take each row and add it to our 2D vector. And by doing that, we're able to produce a grid or a 2D structure. Let's briefly demonstrate this in C-Line. All right, so here is our 2D vector program. And you'll see that first, we're just trying to copy data from a 2D array and place it into our 2D vector. So what we're doing here is we're actually taking an individual 1D vector called rho, and we are adding one element from our 2D array into that row vector. So we copy an, a, an individual row from our array into our row vector, and then we use my vector push back to copy that row and add it to our 2D vector. And then we can clear that row to delete the data and reuse it in another iteration of our loop. So this program will actually allow us to go through and construct a two-dimensional vector by stacking multiple 1D vectors together. And all we need to do is just creatively use for loops and the pushback function in order to construct that vector. If I run this program, you can see what's happening where initially we have a 2D matrix. And what I can do is I can basically copy row one, two, three, and four, five, six into one dimensional vectors, and then stack these two together to get a two dimensional vector. Once that vector is declared and initialized, I can use it just like how I would a two dimensional array, and I can access the data inside that vector using i and j indexing. All right, so let's go ahead and wrap up here for today. Hopefully, after seeing this video, you've started to see how arrays have many useful applications, not just in programming, but in different areas of science and engineering as well. We can use arrays to help us manipulate images, help us solve math problems and linear algebra problems. And we can also use arrays as building blocks for additional tools like the string class and the vector class. Remember, for the purposes of this course, I do not expect you to know those advanced details about the string class and vector class. However, I do encourage you to learn them, especially if you plan to take more advanced programming courses. We're going to revisit classes a little bit later and revisit strings and vectors once we cover classes in C++. For now, please make sure you're comfortable using for loops and functions to manipulate 1D and multidimensional arrays. This is a really important skill 
that you'll find incredibly valuable as you continue to write programs in this class. Thanks everyone for joining the fun today, and feel free to reach out if you have further questions. This concludes our discussion of arrays, but in our next video, we're going to start talking more about pointers. And we're going to learn about how pointers allow us to directly manipulate memory in C++.